Okay. Um, welcome to lesson four. Uh, we are going to finish our journey through these uh, kind of key applications. Uh, we've already looked at a range of vision applications. We've looked at classification, um, localization, image regression. Um, we've briefly touched on NLP. Uh, we're going to do a deep, deeper dive into NLP transfer learning today. Uh, we're going to then look at tabular data, and we're going to look at um, collaborative filtering, uh, which are both super useful applications. Uh, and then we're going to take a, a, a complete U-turn. We're going to take that collaborative filtering example and dive deeply into it to understand exactly what's happening mathematically, exactly what's happening in the computer, and we're going to use that to gradually go back in reverse order through the applications again. Um, in order to understand exactly what's going on behind the scenes of all of those applications. Uh, before we do, um, somebody on the forum was kind enough to point out that when we compared ourselves uh, to the, uh, what we think might be the state of the art, or was recently the state of the art for Canvid, um, it wasn't a fair comparison, um, because the paper actually used a small subset of the um, classes, and we used all of the classes, uh, so Jason in our study group was kind enough to rerun the experiments um, with the uh, correct subset of classes from the paper, and our accuracy went up to 94% uh, compared to 91.5% in the paper. So I think that's a really cool result and a great example of how uh, some pretty, you know, pretty much just using the defaults nowadays can, can get you far beyond what was the best of a year or two ago. Uh, but certainly the best last year when we were doing this course, because we started it quite, quite intensely. So that's really exciting. Um, so what I wanted to start with is uh, going back over NLP a little bit um, to understand really what was going on there. So first of all, um, a quick review. Um, so remember NLP is natural language processing, it's about taking text, and um, doing something with it. Uh, and uh, uh, text classification is a particularly useful, uh, kind of practically useful application, so it's what we're gonna start off focusing on. Because classifying a text, classifying a, a document, can be used for anything from spam prevention, uh, to um, identifying fake news, uh, to um, finding a diagnosis for medical reports, um, uh, finding uh, mentions of your product in Twitter, um, so on and so forth. Um, so it's pretty interesting. Um, and actually there was a great example, there was a great example during the week from um, one of uh, our students who uh, is a, um, a lawyer, uh, and uh, he uh, mentioned on the forum that he had a um, really great results from classifying uh, legal texts using this NLP approach, and I thought this was a great example. So this is the poster uh, that they presented um, at an academic conference this week uh, describing the approach. And actually this uh, series of three steps that you see here, and I'm sure you recognize this classification matrix, um, this series of three steps here is uh, what we're gonna start by digging into. So we're gonna start out with a movie review like this one, and gonna decide whether it's positive or negative uh, sentiment about the movie. Um, that is the problem. We have um, in the training set 25,000 movie reviews. Uh, so we've got uh, 25,000 movie reviews and uh, for each one we have like one bit of information. They liked it or they didn't like it. And as we're gonna look into in a lot, lot more detail uh, today and in the current lessons, our neural networks, remember they're just um, a bunch of uh, matrix multiplies and simple nonlinearities, uh, particularly replacing negatives with zeros. Um, those weight matrices start out random. And so if you start out with, with some random parameters and um, try to train those parameters to learn how to recognize positive versus negative movie reviews, you only have 20, literally 25,000 ones and zeros to actually tell you, I like this one, I don't like that one. That's clearly not enough information to learn basically how to speak English, how to speak English well enough to recognize they liked this or they didn't like this. 
and sometimes that can be pretty nuanced, right? The English language, often particularly with like movie reviews, people, because these are like online movie reviews on IMDb, people can often like use sarcasm, it can be really quite tricky. So, it, for a long time, until, in fact, until very recently, like this year, um, neural nets didn't do a good job at all of this kind of classification problem. And, and that was why, there's not enough information available. So the trick, hopefully you can all guess, it's to use transfer learning. It's always the trick. So last year in this course, um, I tried something crazy, which was I thought, what if I try transfer learning uh, to demonstrate that it can work for an LP as well? And, um, and I tried it out and it worked extraordinarily well. And so here we are a year later and transfer learning in NLP is absolutely the, the hit thing now. And so I'm going to describe to you what happens. The key thing is we're going to start with the same kind of thing that we used uh, for computer vision, a pre-trained model that's been trained to do something different to what we're doing with it. And so um, for ImageNet, that was originally built as a model to predict which of a thousand categories each photo falls into, and people then fine-tuned that for all kinds of different things, as we've seen. Um, so we're going to start with a pre-trained model that's going to do something else, uh, not movie review classification. We're going to start with a pre-trained model which is called a language model. A language model is a very has a very specific meaning in NLP, and it's this. A language model is a model that learns to predict the next word of a sentence. Right? And to predict the next word of a sentence, you actually have to know quite a lot about English, uh, assuming you're doing it in English, and quite a lot of world knowledge. And by world knowledge, I'll give you an example. Here's your language model, and it's read, I'd like to eat a hot, what? Obviously, dog, right? It was a hot, what? Probably day, right? Now, previous approaches to NLP use something called n-grams, largely, which is basically saying how often do these pairs or triplets of words tend to appear next to each other. And n-grams are terrible at this kind of thing. As you can see, there's not enough information here to decide what the next word probably is. But with a neural net, you absolutely can. So here's the nice thing. If you train a neural net to predict the next word of a sentence, then you actually have a lot of information. Rather than having a single bit for every 2,000 word movie review, liked it or didn't like it, every single word you can try and predict the next word. So in a 2,000 word movie review, there are 1,999 opportunities to predict the next word. Better still, you don't just have to look at movie reviews. Because really the hard thing isn't so much is, does this person like the movie or not, but how do you speak English? Right? So you can learn how do you speak English, roughly, from some much bigger set of documents. And so what we did was we started with Wikipedia. And uh, Stephen Merity and some of his colleagues built something called the Wikitext 103 data set, which is simply um, a subset of most of the largest articles from Wikipedia um, with a little bit of pre-processing that's available for download. Uh, and so you're basically grabbing Wikipedia and then I built a language model on all of Wikipedia. Right? So I just built a neural net which would predict the next word in every significantly sized Wikipedia article. And that's a lot of information. It's, if I remember correctly, it's something like a billion tokens. Right, so we've got a billion separate things to predict. Every time we make a mistake on one of those predictions, we get uh, the loss can get uh, we get gradients from that, and we can update our weights and make them better and better until we can get pretty good at predicting the next word of Wikipedia. Why is that useful? Because at that point, I've got a model that knows probably how to complete sentences like this, and so it knows quite a lot about English and quite a lot about how the world works, what kinds of things tend to be hot in different situations, for instance. I mean, ideally it would learn things like, in 1996, in a speech to the United Nations, the United States President Blah said. Now that would be a really good language model because it would actually have to know who was the United States President in that year. So like getting really good at training language models 
is a great way to learn a lot about, or teach a neural net, a lot about, you know, what is our world, what's in our world, how do things work in our world. So it's a really fascinating uh, topic. And it's actually one that uh, philosophers have been studying for hundreds of years now. Uh, there's actually a whole theory of philosophy which is about like what can be learned from studying language alone. So it turns out, empirically, uh, quite a lot. And so here's the interesting thing. You can start by training a language model on all of Wikipedia, and then we can make that available to all of you. Just like a pre-trained image net model for vision, we've now made available a pre-trained wiki text model for NLP. Not because it's particularly useful of itself, predicting the next word of sentences is somewhat useful, but not normally what we want to do, but it tells us it, it's, a, it's a model that understands a lot about language and a lot about what language describes. So then we can take that and we can do transfer learning to create a new language model that's specifically good at predicting the next word of movie reviews. So if we can build a language model that's good at predicting the next word of movie reviews, pre-trained with the wiki text model, right, then that's going to understand a lot about my favorite actor is Tom who, right? Or, you know, um, I thought the photography was fantastic, but I wasn't really so happy about the director, whatever, right? It's going to learn a lot about specifically how movie reviews are written. It'll even learn things like what are the names of some popular movies. So that would then mean we can still use a huge corpus of lots of movie reviews, even if we don't know whether they're positive or negative, right, to learn a lot about how movie reviews are written. So for all of this pre-training and all of this language model fine-tuning, we don't need any labels at all. It's what um, uh, the researcher Jan LeCun calls self-supervised learning. In other words, it's a classic supervised model. We have labels, right, but the labels are not things that somebody else have created. They're kind of built into the data set itself. So this is really, really neat, because at this point we've now got something that's good at understanding movie reviews, and we can fine-tune that with transfer learning to do the thing we want to do, which in this case is to classify movie reviews to be positive or negative. And so my hope was, when I tried this last year, that at that point 25,000 ones and zeros would be enough feedback to fine-tune that model. And it turned out it absolutely was. All right, Rachel, let's... Go with a question. Does the language model approach work for text in forums that are informal English, misspelled words, or slang, or short form like S6 instead of Samsung S6? Yes, absolutely it does. Um, particularly if you start with your wiki text model and then fine tune it with your, we call it a target corpus, right? So your a corpus is just a bunch of documents, right? It could be emails or tweets or medical reports or whatever. Uh, so you could fine tune it um, uh, so it can learn a bit about the specifics of the slang if, you know, or, sh or abbreviations or whatever that didn't appear in the full corpus. And so interestingly, um, this is one of the big things that people were surprised about when we did this research last year. People thought that learning from something like Wikipedia wouldn't be that helpful because it's not that representative of how people tend to write. But it turns out it's extremely helpful because there's a much bigger difference between Wikipedia and random words than there is between like Wikipedia and Reddit, say. So it kind of gets you 99% of the way there. So these um, language models um, themselves can be quite powerful. So for example, there was a blog post from, um, um, what are they called, SwiftKey, SwiftType, um, SwiftKey, um, the folks that do the um, mobile phone uh, predictive text keyboard, and they described how they kind of uh, rewrote their, their underlying model to use neural nets. So and it, now, this was a year or two ago, now most phone keyboards seem to do this. You'll be typing away on your mobile phone, and in the predictions there'll be something telling you what word you might want next. So that's a language model in your phone. Uh, another example was the researcher Andre Kapathy, who's now um, uh, runs all this stuff at uh, Tesla. Uh, back when he was a PhD student, he created a language model of um, uh, text in LaTeX documents, 
and uh, created these uh, automatic uh, uh, generation of LaTeX documents that then became <laughs> these kind of automatically generated papers. So that's pretty cute. So we're not really that interested in the output of the language model ourselves. We're just interested in, in it because it's, it's, it's helpful with this process. So um, we briefly looked at the process uh, last week. So let's like just have a reminder. Right? The, the basic process is we're going to start with um, the, the data in some format. So for example, we've prepared a little IMDB sample that you can use where it's in CSV file. So you can read it in with pandas and see there's negative or positive, the text of each movie review, and a boolean of is it in the validation set or the training set. So there's an example of a movie review. And so you can just go text data bunch from CSV to grab a um, language model specific data bunch and then you can create a learner from that in the usual way and fit it. Um, you can save the data bunch, which means that the pre-processing that is done, you don't have to do it again, you can just load it. So what goes on behind the scenes? Well, what happens behind the scenes if we now load it as a uh, classification data bunch, that's going to allow us to see the labels as well. Um, then, uh, as we described, it basically creates a separate uh, unit, we call it a token, for each separate uh, part of a word. So most of them are just four words, but sometimes if it's like an apostrophe S from its, it'll get its own token. Um, uh, every bit of punctuation tends to get its own token, like a comma or a full stop, um, and so forth. And then um, the next thing that we do is a numericalization, which is where we find what are all of the um, uh, unique tokens that appear here, and we create a big list of them. Here's the first 10 in order of frequency. And that big list of unique possible tokens is called the vocabulary. We just call it vocab. And so what we then do is we replace the tokens with the ID of where is that token in the vocab. Okay, and that, that's numericalization. Um, here's the thing though. Um, as you'll learn, uh, every word in our vocab is going to require um, a separate row in a weight matrix in our neural net. And so to avoid that weight matrix getting too huge, um, we restrict the vocab to no more than, by default, 60,000 words. And if a word doesn't appear more than two times, we don't put it in the vocab either. So we kind of uh, keep the vocab uh, to a reasonable size in that way. And so when you see these um, XXUNC, that's an unknown token. Um, so um, when you see those unknown tokens, it just means uh, this was something that was uh, uh, not a common enough word to appear in our vocab. Um, okay, so there is the numericalized version. Um, we also have a couple of other special tokens like um, XX field. Uh, this is a special thing where if you've got like title, summary, abstract, body, like separate parts of a document, uh, each one will get a separate field, um, so they all get numbered. Um, also you'll find if there's something in all caps, it gets lowercase and a token called XX cap will get added to it. Um, personally, I more often use the data block API because you get, um, uh, you kind of, there's less to remember about exactly what data bunch to use and what parameters and so forth, and it can be a bit more flexible. Um, so another approach to doing this is to just decide what kind of list you're creating. So what's your independent variable? So in this case, my independent variable is text. Um, what is it coming from? A CSV. Um, how do you want to split it into validation versus uh, training? Uh, so in this case, column number two was the is validation flag. Uh, how do you want to uh, label it uh, with positive or negative sentiment, for example? So column zero had that, and then turn that into a data bunch. That's going to do the same thing. Um, okay, so now um, let's grab the whole data set, which has uh, 25,000 reviews in training, 25,000 reviews in validation, and then 50,000 what they call unsupervised movie reviews. So 50,000 movie reviews that haven't been scored at all. Uh, so there it is, positive, negative, unsupervised. So we're going to start, as we described, with um, the language model. 
Now the good news is we don't have to train the Wikitext 103 language model. Not that it's difficult, you can use exactly the same steps that you see here, just download the Wikitext 103 um, corpus and run the same code. Uh, but it takes two or three days on a decent GPU, so not much point you doing it. Uh, you may as well start with hours. Even if you've got a big corpus of like medical documents or legal documents, you should still start with Wikitext 103. Like there's just no reason to start with random weights. Um, it's always good to use transfer learning if you can. Um, so we're going to start then at this point, which is um, fine-tuning our IMDB language, uh, language model. So we can say, okay, it's a list of text files, and the full uh, IMDB actually is not in a CSV. Each, um, each document is a separate text file. So that's why we use a different constructor for our independent variable, text files list, say where it is. And in this case, we have to make sure we just don't include the train and test folders. And we randomly split it by 0 0.1. Now this is interesting, 10%. Why are we randomly splitting it by 10% rather than using the predefined train and test they gave us? This is one of the cool things about transfer learning. Even though our test set or our validation set has to be held aside, it's actually only the labels that we have to keep aside. So we're not allowed to use the labels in the test set. Uh, so if you think about something like a Kaggle competition, you certainly can't use the labels because they don't even give them to you. But you can certainly use the independent variables, so in this case you could absolutely use the text that is in the, um, the test set to train your language model. So this is a good trick, right, is actually when you do the language model, concatenate the training and test set together, and then just split out a smaller validation set, so you've got more data uh, to train your language model. So that's a little trick. And so if you're doing NLP stuff on Kaggle, for example, or you know, you've just got a smaller subset of labeled data, um, make sure that you use all of the text you have to train your language model, because there's no reason not to. How are we going to label it? Well, remember, a language model kind of has its own labels. So the text itself is a label, so label for language model does that for us. And create a data bunch. And save it, and that takes a few minutes uh, to tokenize and numericalize. So since that takes a few minutes, we save it, later on you can just load it. No need to run that again. Uh, so here's what it looks like. Um, and at this point, things are going to look very familiar. We create a learner. But instead of creating a CNN learner, we're going to create a language model learner. So behind the scenes, this is actually not going to create a CNN, a convolutional neural network. It's going to create an RNN a recurrent neural network. So we're going to be learning exactly how they're built um, over the coming lessons. Um, but in short, they're the same basic structure. Uh, the input goes into um, a weight matrix, a matrix multiply, that then you replace the negatives with zeros, and it goes into another matrix multiply, and so forth a bunch of times. Um, so it's the same basic structure. Um, so uh, as usual, when we um, create a learner, you have to pass in two things, the data, so here's our language model data, um, and um, in this case, uh, what pre-trained model we want to use. And so here, the pre-trained model is the Wikitext 103 model. Uh, that will be downloaded for you from FastAI if you haven't used it before, just like the same thing with um, things like ImageNet pre-trained models are downloaded for you. Um, this here sets the amount of dropout. Uh, we haven't talked about that yet. We've talked briefly about this idea that there's something called regularization, and you can reduce the regularization to avoid underfitting. Um, so for now, just know that um, by using a number lower than one uh, is because when I first tried to run this, I was underfitting, and so if you reduce that number, then it will avoid underfitting. Um, okay, so we've got a learner. We can LR find. Looks pretty standard. And so then we can fit one cycle. And so what's happening here is we are just fine-tuning the last layers. Um, so normally after we fine-tune the last layers, um, the next thing we do is we go um, unfreeze and train the whole thing. Um, and so here it is, unfreeze and train the whole thing. And as you can see, even on a pretty beefy G GPU, that takes two or three hours. And in fact, I'm still underfitting, right? So I'd, I'd probably tonight I might train it overnight and try and do a little bit better. Right? Because you can see, um, 
Well, I guess I'm not underfitting. I'm, I, I, I'm guessing I could probably train this a bit longer because you can see the accuracy hasn't started going down again. Right, so I wouldn't mind trying to train that a bit longer. Um, but the accuracy, it's interesting. Point three means, you know, we're guessing the next mo word of the movie review correctly about a third of the time. So that sounds like a pretty high number, the idea that you can actually guess the next word uh, that often. So that's a good sign that my language model is doing pretty well. For um, kind of more limited domain documents like um, medical transcripts and legal transcripts, you'll often find this accuracy gets, gets a lot higher. Um, um, so sometimes this can be even 50% or more. Um, but if, you know, 0.3 or more is, is pretty good. So um, you can now run learn.predict and pass in the start of a sentence and it will try and finish off that sentence for you. Now, I should mention we, this is not designed to be a good text generation system. This is really more designed to kind of check that it seems to be creating something that's vaguely sensible. Um, there's a lot of tricks that you can use to generate much higher quality text, none of which we're using here. Right? But uh, you can kind of see that it's, it's, it's you know, certainly not random words that it's generating, it sounds vaguely English-like, even though it doesn't make any sense. So at this point, we have a movie review model. So now we're going to save that in order to um, load it into our classifier to be our pre-trained model for the classifier, but I actually don't want to save the whole thing. Um, a lot of this, you know, kind of the second half, as we'll learn, the second half of the language model is all about predicting the next word rather, about, rather than about understanding the sentence so far. So the bit which is specifically about understanding the sentence so far is called the encoder, um, so I just saved that. All right, so, and again, we're going to learn the details of this um, over the coming weeks. Um, we're just going to save the encoder, so the bit that understands the sentence rather than the bit that generates the word. So now we're ready to create our classifier. So step one, as per usual, is to create a data bunch, and we're going to do basically exactly the same thing, bring it in, okay, and here's our path. But we want to make sure that it uses exactly the same vocab that it used for the language model. If word number 10 was the in the language model, we need to make sure that word number 10 is the in the classifier, because otherwise the pre-trained model is going to be totally meaningless. So that's why we pass in the, the vocab from the language model to make sure that this data bunch is going to have exactly the same vocab. So that's an important step. Um, split by folder, and this time label, so remember the last time we had split randomly, okay, but this time we need to make sure that the labels of the test set are not touched, so we split by folder. And then this time we label it not for a language model, but we label these classes, and then finally create a data bunch. Um, and remember, sometimes you'll find that you run out of GPU memory. Um, this will very often uh, happen to you if you, so I was running this in an 11 gig machine, so you should make sure this number's a bit lower if you run out of memory. You may also want to make sure you restart the notebook and kind of start it just from here. Um, so batch size 50 is as high as I could get on an 11 gig card. If you're using a P2 or P3 on Amazon, um, or the K80 on um, uh, Google, for example, I think you'll get 16 gig, so you might be able to make this a bit higher, get it up to 64. So you can find whatever batch size fits on your card. Um, so here's our um, data bunch, as we saw before, and the labels. So this time, rather than creating a um, language model learner, we're creating a text classifier learner. But again, same thing pass in the data that we want, um, figure out how much regularization we need. Again, if you're um, overfitting, um, then you can increase this number. If you're underfitting, you can decrease the number. Um, and most importantly, load in our pre-trained model. And remember specifically, it's this, this, this half of the model called the encoder, which is the bit that we want to load in. And freeze, LR find, find the learning rate, and fit for a little bit. And we're already up nearly to 92% accuracy after less than three minutes of training. 
So this is a nice thing. In your particular domain, whether it be law or medicine or journalism or government or whatever, you probably only need to train your domain's language model once, and that might take, you know, overnight to train well. But once you've got it, you can now very quickly create all kinds of different classifiers and models with that. In, you know, in this case, already a pretty good model after three minutes, right? So, so when you first start doing this, you might find it a bit, it's like annoying that your first models take four hours more or more to create that language model. But the key thing to remember is you only have to do that